Many of these spiritual practices are about connection, and connection is what makes us feel happy on the whole, whereas disconnection, separation, alienation is what makes people feel miserable on the whole. And so singing and chanting, and, uh, you know, they have physiological effects, lower cortisol levels, stress hormone levels, and so on. Um, and there are some people, including actually Charles Darwin, uh, who suggested that humans sang together before they spoke, that sp singing comes before speaking. And actually that's now borne out by modern evolutionary biology theories, and I, I think it's the most plausible explanation. Uh, early human groups achieved a kind of coherence and synchronization through singing and dancing, and speaking was a kind of spin-off from the singing. Uh, singing came first. Fasting is another spiritual practice I discuss in my book, Ways to Go Beyond. Um, all traditions have it, and, and it uh, brings about measurable physiological changes. I myself fast during Holy Week before Easter every year for uh, four days or, more or so, just water and tea. And what that does is causes the, the body to burn up the available sugar supplies in the liver, the, the, the stores of carbohydrate, are exhausted within about 12 hours. And then you're burning up fats. You go into ketosis. And one of the ketones in the blood is uh, beta-hydroxybutyric acid, uh, which is very closely related to gamma-hydroxybutyric acid, a neurotransmitter, which is in the brain, and gamma-aminobutyric acid, which is a neurotransmitter. And the, 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 it change, alters the state of mind. So fasting is, is psychoactive. Um, it also removes senescent cells from the body that cause inflammation. It's very good for physical health for most people. Not advisable for anorexics, advanced diabetics, and so on. But for many people, it's the cheapest and simplest way of improving physical health, as well as spiritual and mental health. Of course, that is not something much most people do research on. There's nothing in, in this for food companies or for drug companies, and so it tends to be neglected. But if I ran the NHS, I'd roll out fasting counselors and promote fasting for many people in the population, but the cheapest and simplest intervention to improve national health. And it'll, because it leads to a greater clarity of mind, it helps for prayer and meditation, and people often have more vivid dreams. Well, there are many other spiritual practices, including collective celebrations through festivals. And again, festivals in all cultures um, have a way of bringing people together, that sense of bonding and community. I lived seven years in India, and I was very impressed by the way in which they really take their festivals seriously there, and everyone's involved, the children, the whole community. Um, and it's a way in which people gain identity, cohesion, and connection with the community. And then there are a range of other spiritual practices. Um, I'll just mention one because it's uh, one more because it's slightly surprising, namely sports. I think that sports are one of the most common and yet least appreciated spiritual practices in our culture. And the reason people, I think, are so fond of sports, apart from just feeling fit and the excitement of competitive <laughs> games and so on, is because they bring people into the present. I first realized this when talking to a friend in America who had a very busy life and told me that his mind was racing all the time, he couldn't sleep at night, he'd tried meditation, it didn't work for him. But he was a rock climber. He said by the time he was 50 feet up a rock face, the only thing that mattered was where the next toe holds and finger holds were, and he was completely in the present. If you're in the middle of a football game and people are cheering on and the ball's being passed to you and stuff, you have to be completely present. You can't be worrying about what you didn't do yesterday or what you might do tomorrow. Uh, meditation is about coming into the present, but sports bring people into the present, even as spectators, uh, uh, much more effectively and quickly, I think. And I think it's one reason so many people do them, and one reason by many, why many people actually have spiritual experiences, this sense of presence and connection through sports. What I mainly want to focus on, though, is uh, the spiritual practice of pilgrimage, which is present in all cultures. Um, there's, uh, we find it in India, in, uh, in Buddhist countries, people go to 
places where the Buddha was born or was enlightened, mainly in India. Um, we find it in Islam with pilgrimages to um, the uh, Mecca and to other holy places. And of course, in the Christian tradition, medieval Europe was crisscrossed with pilgrimage routes. Here in England, the most famous was the pilgrimage to Canterbury, uh, to the shrine of Thomas Becket. And I think that pilgrimage fulfills a very deep archetypal human need. Our ancestors were all hunter-gatherers. They moved around the landscape. Um, they um, went to, uh, on their journey, the Australian Aborig Aborigines call these songlines. They tell the story, they sing the story of the key places they visited on the journey. And if you're hunter-gatherers, you have to move around because animals and plants don't just come to you. Fruit doesn't just drop into your lap and the animals you eat don't just come and meekly offer themselves up to be sacrificed. Um, you have to move around with the seasons. And so this moving and uh, reaching significant places is fundamental to our whole ancestral history. And I think when the Neolithic uh, revolution occurred, when people settled down and began agriculture, uh, they still had holy places they went to, especially for special seasonal festivals, Stonehenge being one example. It was not in the middle of a city, um, but people converged on Stonehenge for these festivals. A little bit like today, people converge on Glastonbury for the Glastonbury Festival. So I think in a sense these summer music festivals have reinvented some of these ancient festivals. Well, in England there were many shrines. One of them was the shrine of our, the Black Madonna in Walsingham, the um, uh, shrine of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, but at the Protestant Reformation, um, pilgrimage in England was suppressed. In 1538, Thomas Cromwell issued an injunction against pilgrimage, made it illegal to go on pilgrimage. The shrines were desecrated. The monasteries that provided the infrastructure for pilgrims where they could sleep and get fed uh, were destroyed. Um, the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham was destroyed. The image of Our Lady was burned in a public bonfire. And one reason they were so against the cult of Our Lady was because they said that uh, treating uh, St. Mary as the mother of God uh, was basically uh, a resurgence of ancient goddess cults and this was basically pagan. Well, I think that's the great strength of the cult of the Blessed Virgin Mary, precisely that it is, um, uh, inherits many of these goddess elements. Anyway, they didn't like it, and they suppressed pilgrimage in England, which left a great void in the soul of the English. Um, it was suppressed in Wales and Scotland as well, and in other Protestant countries. But it left a great void, and I think that's why the English invented uh, tourism. Um, tourism <laughs> is best seen as a form of secularized pilgrimage. Um, tourists still go to the great holy places, the cathedrals, the temples, and so forth. But being tourists, they have to pretend that they're enlightenment, modern, secular people, and they're basically going out of a deep interest in art history, uh, rather than going there uh, to light a candle or say a prayer or, or in, uh, uh, address the god or the goddess or the spirit of the place. Um, and in fact, it's very unsatisfying. All they can do is take photos. Um, so I think actually pilgrimage is best seen as frustrated pilgrimage. Um, and I think one of the paradigm shifts that's going on today is the shift from tourism to pilgrimage, going back to pilgrimage. There's an enormous revival of pilgrimage going on in Europe at the moment. Uh, the, the most famous, iconic pilgrimage place is Santiago de Compostela in Spain, and some of you may have been there. Um, in 1987, when the route was newly opened up and they would got the infrastructure in place, about 1,000 people walked there. In 2019, it was 330,000 people that walked to Santiago de Compostela. And as a result of that, all over Europe, there's been a revival of pilgrimage. Here in Britain, there's an organization called the British Pilgrimage Trust, uh, which is reopening the ancient footpath pilgrimage routes to Canterbury and to other ancient holy places. Um, in the last two years, they've opened uh, uh, short one-day pilgrimage routes, five or six miles, to all 42 of the cathedrals in England. There's a major route being developed at the moment from Ireland, walking through Ireland, getting the ferry across to Wales, and then to the great, the most important cathedral in Wales, St. David's. It goes to St. David's Cathedral.
There are a number of other pilgrimage routes being developed and opened up here in Britain at the moment. And uh, if you're interested in this, I'd strongly recommend going to the website BritishPilgrimage.org where you can find uh, details of these routes. Now, holy places can be many and varied. In Britain, because of our history, they're mainly cathedrals and churches. There are also holy wells, sacred trees, mountain tops, sources of rivers. And these pilgrimage routes include all those kinds of holy places. And holy places all over the world have been seen as joining points between heaven and earth. And they're typically associated with vertical structures. There are some like caves, which are not where you're going into the bowels of the earth, but many of them with standing stones, with obelisks, with towers and spires, um, uh, structures where the symbolically the structure points up into the heaven and links the heaven and the earth. But it's more than just symbolic, because these vertical structures actually attract lightning. Lightning doesn't just strike at random, it strikes at the highest places. And when you put metal lightning conductors on them, they become even more attractive to lightning. So basically, our holy places like towers, church towers and spires, and, uh, and prominent standing stones, and other holy places, actually funnel lightning into the ground in that place. They collect it from quite a wide radius and channel it into the ground in that holy place. So they are literally places where the energy of the heavens, which comes from the solar wind through the ionosphere, down through sprites to the clouds and then into the ground, is coming into the earth. No one in Britain seems to know how often these buildings are, st are struck, but I've discovered in France there's a company that makes lightning strike counters, which you clip on the lightning conductor, you bolt them on, um, and they're electromechanical, very satisfyingly. They don't require batteries, because when you have a million volts going down a lightning <laughs> conductor, uh, you can use the free power uh, uh, that makes these things work. And every time a lightning strike goes down the conductor, a mechanical digital thing moves over one click. And so it would say five, and there's a lightning strike, then it'll say six. So you can monitor uh, when they occur. And actually in France, I discovered, uh, by law, all churches, cathedrals, and other tall structures have to make an annual report of how many lightning strikes they've had. There's somewhere in France, there's a database with this amazing information, and as far as I know, no one's looked at it or analyzed it, but it would be very fascinating to do that. I've imported some of these lightning strike counters, and several are going to be fitted on parish churches in the next few weeks um, um, as a p pilot scheme. and. Um, I'm already in discussion with the Association of English Cathedrals to see if we can have them fitted on all our cathedrals. The average cathedral has about five lightning conductors from the various towers and so on. And um, um, uh, that could be monitored. It all c could all be online, you know, whenever they're struck by lightning. I think it would be really interesting. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.